In this video, we're going to focus on how to simplify radicals that involve monomials. We can see the first two examples here that not only do we have a coefficient, we also have our variables in the radicals. So we're going to focus on how to simplify them. There is a pattern to this. The first two examples, we're going to do the long way and then try and discover the pattern together. So when you're doing a problem, you're simplifying where you have a coefficient and variables, what you want to do is just break them apart into two separate radicals. So I break apart the 121 and the x cubed, and then just simplify them separately. I mean, the square root of 121, it's a perfect square, is 11. And then let's try the prime factorization technique with x cubed to kind of help us see the pattern. x cubed means we have x times x times x. So I have one pair of x's with one x remaining inside. And so my final answer is 11x radical x. So when I had a, an exponent of 3, I was able to take out one pair of x's, because I have a set of 2 here. But there is still a re one remaining inside. So let's try and keep this in mind when we do the next problem with finding the pattern. So here, I'm going to break it apart to the square root of 36 times the square root of x squared. I'm going to break each variable into its own radical right now. And so now I have y cubed in the radical and square root of z to the fifth. Well, again, I see 36 is a perfect square. The square root of 36 is 6. You know, what's the square root of x squared? Well, that's x. And again, I can look at the prime factorization if I want. You know, x squared means you have two x's, so you have one pair. So that's interesting. When I had an exponent of 2, I had one pair, so I was able to take out an x, but nothing remains inside. So let's try this one, y cubed. So you have three y's being multiplied. So you have one pair of y's, so you can take one out, and you still have one that remains inside. So times y, square root of y. So what's the pattern? When you do prime factorization, you look for pairs. And if you think back to a couple minutes ago, I used the word sets of two. Because if you're trying to pair something, you're regularly splitting it into two. So mathematically, what that means is you're looking for how many times two goes into it, because that's telling you how many pairs you have. So the shortcut is, look at your exponent. You have five. So to split it into, you want to know how many pairs, how many sets of two do I have, divide it by two. You know, five divided by two is two and a half. So it goes in there twice nicely. If you think about it, you're going to have z, 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 z. You're going to have one pair of z's, two pair of z's, which take care of four of them. You're going to have one remaining inside because that's your remainder. When you take five and divide by two, you get two with a remainder of one. And so one z remains inside. So let's put this all together since it's all separate. You know, on the outside, I have a six, an x, a y, and a z squared. So I have 6xyz squared on the outside. And on the inside, I have the square root of y and z. And so that is my final answer. Now, if you can't quite understand the shortcut right now, we're going to be practicing it in these next few problems. So I have 484x to the 7th, y to the 11th. First thing you always want to do is you want to see is the coefficient of perfect square, because if it is, that's easy. You can just take the square root of it. So I break it apart. I have x to the 7th in the square root, and I have y to the 11th in the square root. Well, the square root of 484, it is a perfect square. The square root of 44 is 22. So let's try the shortcut here. x to the 7th. You know, how many pairs do you have in 7? Well, you have three pairs. Because 7 divided by 2 is 3. Well, that means you have 1 remaining, because 3 times 2 is 6, and you want 7. 
know, 7 divided by 3 is, sorry, 7 divided by 2 is 3 with a remainder of 1. You know, if you have y to the 11th. So how many pairs of y's do you have? We'll take 11 divided by 2. There's five pairs. And there's going to be one remaining inside. Because 11 divided by 2 is 5 with a remainder of 1. And so the exponent of 1 goes inside with this. And so on the outside, you have 22x cubed y to the fifth. And on the inside, you have your x and your y. So square root of x, y. And that is your final answer. So the shortcut is take your exponent for the variable, divide by 2, because that tells you how many pairs, and then put the remainder as your exponent inside with the variable. So this one's unique. First off, I see a negative. So that means I can take that out, and I'm going to make it an i. Good old imaginary numbers. And then we have the square root of 240. I have the square root of x to the fourth, square root of y to the ninth, and square root of z to the fifth. Well, 240, we're going to have to break it down into some of the numbers. And so let's, you know, I can see 24 and 10. It's not the best place to start, but it works, 24 and 10. 10 is 2 and 5. 24, I have 6 and 4, which gives me 3 and 2 and 2 and 2. So I have one pair of 2s, and I have another pair of 2s. So I can take out two twos, which is a 4. On the inside, I still have a 3 and a 5. So 3 times 5 is 15. So I have 4 square root of 15. I still have my i on the outside. I'm going to take in consideration. And then we take care of our variables. You know, x to the 4, the square root of it, 4 divided by 2 is 2. I have y to the 9th. 9 divided by 2 is 4. So I have a y to the 4th with a remainder of y to the 1st inside. 5 divided by 2 is 2. So you have z squared on the outside and you have a remainder of 1 on the inside. So what's my final answer? Piece it all together. On the outside, I have a 4, an x squared, a y to the 4th, a z squared, and an i. So I have 4 x squared, y squared to the fourth, z squared, i, and on the inside, I have a 15 y z. And that's my final answer. So let's do the last two problems. Square root of x squared plus 6x plus 9. So we see here, we have something unique. Unlike the other problems that dealt with our monomials, we have plus signs. This one's actually considered to be a trinomial. So how do I take the square root of this? Well, you can't break it apart. All the other examples, the reason why we've been able to break it apart is because there's multiplication going on between your numbers. That's when you can break it apart. When you have plus signs and minus signs, that's a whole different operation. You can't do that. And so we had to figure out how can we make this so we can work with it. Well, if I take a look at x squared plus 6x plus 9, you know what? It's a trinomial. What do we know how to do with trinomials? We know how to factor them. So what numbers multiply to give you 9 and add to give you 6? Well, that's x plus 3 and x plus 3, which really is, you know, it's the same binomial, x plus 3 times x plus 3, so that means you're squaring it. So if I square root the square of a number, you know, those are inverse operations, so they cancel each other out. And so my final answer is just x plus 3. So the key that you have to learn here, the idea is you can't break apart across plus signs or minus signs, only across multiplication or division, which is good for this example. There is division going on. So I still have a 5 on the outside, but I can break apart to the square root of 4 over the square root of 81. So the square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 81 is 9. 
So 5 times 2 is 10. You have 10 ninths. So we can break radicals apart across fractions because that's division. Or when we're dealing with all multiplication in the previous four problems. But when there's a plus sign or a minus sign, especially a trinomial, you have to keep in mind what do you know how to do with trinomials to simplify them and you know how to factor them. So try that and see if you can break it from there.